I'm Paul Schwartz, and it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's guest. Giovanni Buttarelli has been the European Data Protection Supervisor since December 2014, appointed for a five-year term by a joint decision of the European Parliament and the Council. He was previously Secretary General to the Italian Data Protection Authority. His experience on data protection includes participation in many bodies at the European Union level and at the Council of Europe. And here's a quotation from Giovanni. The EU has to make existing data protection rights more effective. And tonight we'll hear about how he hopes to do that. Cindy Cohen is the executive director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where she previously served as legal director and general counsel. She has also worked as a civil litigator in private practice, handling technology-related cases, and worked for a year at the UN Center for Human Rights in Geneva. And here's a quotation about, not from Cindy Cohen, the National Law Journal in naming Cindy, one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America, stated, if Big Brother is watching, he better look out for Cindy Cohen. So I hope tonight we'll find out what Big Brother has to worry about from Cindy's corner. So here's how I would like to start. My first question uh, will give our two speakers a chance to situate themselves and their organization. So each of you, Giovanni, tell us a little bit about the, um, the EDPS, the European Data Protection Supervisor, where you sit, what you do, and then we'll hear from Cindy about the activities of the EFF. Thank you for, for uh, this warm introduction and, and, and thank you for inviting me. It's a, for me a real uh, honor to, to appear before the, the Words of Fair Council and uh, with particular regard to, to this um, moment, uh, which, which is crucial uh, in terms of protection of fundamental rights and freedoms around the world. I'm a member of the judiciary detached to EU institutions. I only served in my life uh, the public service. Um, as you said, I've been elected in December last year to appoint the European Data Protection Supervisor is more complicated than electing the president of the US. 28 governments, uh, 781 MPs, and the European Commission should all agree as a result of a long-term selection a process which is fully transparent. And um, this explains why uh, the strong independence of the institution, of which I'm very proud, uh, um, is part of the, the process. We, we supervise European Union institutions. They have, um, I mean, a lot of databases, um, in also in the area of migration, asylum, uh, refugees, um, cooperation um, among uh, police and judicial authorities. We advised the legislator with regard to uh, the introduction of soft and hard legislation, as it was the case for the um, reform um, currently under discussion, the last mile of uh, a marathon effort, and finally we of course cooperate with the national authorities established at, uh, at, um, national, uh, at the national level. So we, we are now deeply engaged in, in, uh, in the process of modernizing uh, the EU rules, uh, and this is playing why um, I'm here in this wonderful valley to, to listen, to, to learn, uh, and to understand how technologies will evolve in the next five years, because the, the challenge for us is to uh, introduce uh, effective rules, more effective in practice, to, to, um, to make existing principles um, effective in the big data and internet of things uh, world, and, and to also analyze um, how to develop the principles of privacy by design and privacy by default. Thank you. Um, well, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, I, I think in Giovanni's world, we're what's known as civil society. Um, we are a nonprofit based here in San Francisco. Our offices are in the Tenderloin. Um, we work to protect your free speech, privacy, and other rights when you go online. Uh, EFF was... Uh, 
uh, created by uh, some folks 25 years ago who recognized that with the coming digital revolution, questions about our fundamental rights, including free speech and privacy, uh, were going to come up anew as we all started participating in a networked society. Um, and they were, I think, more true than, uh, than maybe even they thought uh, about how important these issues are to our lives now. Um, I used to say that I worked on digital rights, but I, I actually think that digital isn't really important to that statement anymore. So much of what we do and say and believe and our communications are online, um, that, that really they are, it, it's just our rights, not our digital rights at this point for, for, for many, many things. Um, so what do we do? Well, we engage in uh, litigation in the courts. We engage the courts. Uh, many of these issues are constitutional rights issues, and the Constitution is uh, in this country interpreted by the court system fundamentally. Uh, we get involved in legislative battles somewhat. We get involved in public discussions. Um, we're also, uh, we also build um, some technologies. We have a technology called Privacy Badger, which is a plug-in for uh, Firefox and Chrome that helps protect you against persistent cookies, those cookies you really can't see but that follow you, you know, like that ad for shoes that follows you all around the Internet. Uh, those kinds of cookies are the things that we work to try to give you an ability to block them. Um, and we engage internationally, so we are involved in some of the discussions at the EU along with other organizations, usually in coalition. Uh, we work on behalf of people who are persecuted uh, around the world for blogging and, and standing up for their rights, um, and uh, in general try to figure out how best to move the levers of power in order to better protect users around the world. Excellent. Thank you very much. So we placed each of our speakers in context, and now let's think about where we are. We're in beautiful San Francisco, right in the gorgeous Bay Area. We even had a little rain the other day, which was very exciting. Pray for rain. And so let me ask now a California-specific question of both of our guests. What should Silicon Valley be doing? What's the best role? What's the most appropriate role for tech companies? And then if you want to broaden it beyond that, is there a role for the California legislature? Would Giovanni would like to go first? Uh, this is an issue relevant both uh, at federal and, and state levels in, in, uh, in my view. Business uh, companies should think less to, to the business and, and think more on, uh, on how um, an investment on uh, um, fundamental rights and freedoms uh, is, um, I mean, uh, an indispensable um, prerequisite for a, a successful uh, deployment of, of uh, future technologies. Um, I, I just published an opinion uh, Friday uh, last week, which is available on our website, um, to launch a debate on uh, the ethical dimension of the processing of personal uh, data. Um, we think that data protection and privacy provision can, can be of an help, but um, there are there is something else to be uh, to be considered. In our viewpoint, technologies should not dictate the solution just because they are available. Um, we think that um, um, not every uh, technology which is uh, simply um, materially available is as such morally uh, morally tenable. Um, we, we, of course, uh, are pleased to see that in the uh, report published last year by the, the group led by Joe Podesta that there is a reference to the risk for discrimination. Um, and, but we, we would like to go beyond uh, and consider uh, what it means to human dignity. Um, in, in our constitution, the one we uh, introduced in Europe uh, in 2009, the Lisbon, the Lisbon Treaty, uh, human dignity is mentioned before um, fundamental rights and freedoms. Uh, fundamental rights and freedoms um, uh, are uh, w very well protected, but they are subject to potential interferences when uh, the interference is, is fully justified, necessary, and, and proportionate. This is not the case for human dignity, uh, which is, uh, cannot be violated. And what it means human dignity in the big data uh, world. We, we did a reflection on, on 
what human dignity was when the industrial uh, revolution uh, to, took place. And, uh, and now we see a big risk that regardless of potential discrimination um, and, and without prejudice of specific reflections to be made with regard to health data and, and genetic information, uh, there is a, a big risk uh, to, to have individual persons uh, simply treated increasingly as passive um, users, consumers, subscribers, prosumers. Uh, instead of being considered as a natural person. Uh, wh why we call personal information? Because they relate to us. They are a projection of uh, the, human, uh, the human person. And, uh, and therefore, this is not simply an issue of uh, having uh, this information in insecure hands. There is a big um, concern um, around um, the um, transparency. Um, what about the, the logic around algorithms? Uh, there is a lot of um, use of, of data by data brokers, by intermediate players, uh, and they are entirely uh, unknown. There is a risk of chilling effect on what we will be doing in, uh, in the modern society, uh, a risk of, um, I mean, um, being affected by the rule of, of the majority. So uh, perhaps not discriminated at all, but um, the person um, a, as approached by devices, uh, smartphones, we would like to use in, in the smartphone should be uh, better considered in our, uh, in our viewpoint. So business companies should, uh, should reflect uh, on, on these approaches and consider that the rules we are going to introduce um, soon, we, we, we count to see the, the reform published in the official journal by spring next year, uh, will give much more space to uh, accountability, which doesn't mean mere compliance. It means the need to have uh, accessible policy to better explain what you do with the information concerning to uh, to others. So we go much more beyond the intimate sphere and we would like to consider the person as a whole. Um, let me say that the Lisbon Treaty um, has introduced a new fundamental right different from the one to privacy. The right to the protection of personal data which means that the way in which others uh, even for lawful purposes uh, process information concerning me even in cases where uh, they publication on a website I is mandatory, um, it's uh, subject to a fundamental right. I, I would like to be informed about what they are doing, uh, what about security measures, what about retention periods, what about the purpose limitation, what about the data minimization. This is today, regardless of the regulation we are going to introduce soon, a fundamental right. I can approach tomorrow morning a court, a national court, in every country, everywhere, to, to see my fundamental right to the protection of personal data recognized in, in concrete. And, and we would like to share this experience with, with others. We are not here to dictate uh, our solution. But of course, global partnership uh, is essential, particularly with regard to a strategic partner as the US. Thank you. Cindy? Yeah, I think um, he makes a lot of good points about the problems with big data and the, the, the need for us to really begin to think about information about ourselves as important, to, as, as, as important as it actually is. This information is being used to make decisions about you, with you. We know about price discrimination. They're making evaluations based upon the data about what price you get charged with things. Um, but it's going to scale on to other things. And I, I think that the bit, the the era of the you know what I call the surveillance business model, where companies make money by trying to figure out as much about you as they possibly can, is um, something that we ought to really begin to think about whether that's the world we want to live in or not, and how can we best scale it back consistent with you know, making sure that that you know there are there that that we we're having we're building the world that we actually really want to live in. 
Um, um, but there's a second problem with this gigantic collection of data that uh, is occurring about us all the time, and that is the ability of law enforcement and the national security infrastructure to have access to it. Um, and for the tech companies in uh, in the Bay Area, um, they learned, um, I think, a, a hard lesson out of the Snowden revelations. They had um, been cooperating with the National Security Agency at a level that I think was shocking for a lot of people when we first learned about it. Um, but that's not all. They found out that the National Security Agency was also hacking into their systems. You may remember there was a, a slide that came out that had a little uh, post-it note with a smiley face at the place where Google's uh, Google servers connected to each other in an insecure way where data was not encrypted and there was a little smiley face by the NSA guy about how great it was that they could have access to all of your data, right? I mean, we talk about this as tapping into Google, but Google, it's not Google's data. It's all your data, right? How many people here have a Gmail account? <laughs> um, uh, or use Hangout, or uh, have ever done a GChat. I mean, it's Google is a is a company that's deeply embedded, uh, and they're not the only ones that got tapped into. So, when thinking about the role of tech companies, we have to remember that at this point, a lot of tech companies hold our very lives in their hands. And um, we work hard to push on companies to stand up to law enforcement when they come and demand a warrant. We have a, a, a rating system for tech companies called Who Has Your Back, where we rate the major tech companies across the country about whether they demand full due process before they hand over your information um, and, and what kind of notice they give you about what they're doing and whether their policies are transparent. There's a, they get a gold star if they do the right thing because, um, you know, uh, I went to second grade too and gold stars are cool. So, um, so we do a lot of rating and working with the tech companies to try to get them to recognize and step up to the roles of guardian of your privacy because that's actually what they are. Um, we also see tech companies uh, beginning to build systems or at least starting to think about building systems that give you a little more control over your data and give you a little more privacy. Uh, there's a technology called encryption that is your friend. Um, you may have heard the recent debates that are going on. The FBI is complaining that Apple lets you secure your phone against the government. Um, as opposed to making sure that your phone is open to the government and thereby open to a lot of thieves and bad actors around the world. Uh, the FBI is essentially trying to convince U.S. tech companies that they ought to make sure that you can't put a lock on your door that is a secure lock that they can't break. Um, and that they don't have a back door to. Um, and I think that's a problem not only because I worry about a future government that might be bad, which has happened in time, in times in the past, but also because you can't build a lock that only good guys can open and bad guys can't. That just doesn't work. The math doesn't work. The science doesn't work that way. So by demanding that you have weak security, they're not only weakening you against on the off chance that you turn out to be a criminal later, they are weakening you against all the actual criminals out there who want to get access to your data. So we turn to tech companies and we say you need to be good stewards of the data that you have. You need to think about how much data you actually need, which I think is a, an issue, uh, data minimization that Giovanni mentioned. And we need you to build systems that protect us and that work for us rather than working for the US government or in favor of criminals around the world. Okay, excellent. And let me, let me continue this because we are in the Bay Area where so many of the leading tech companies are for. I'll just try to continue on this theme a little bit. And so, um, Cindy, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question first, then Giovanni. But so the notion that you're going to ra rate companies is is brilliant. And so I guess, and because right, companies are not just you know one person making the decision, right? There are a group of people, and there are people in the privacy department who will be trying to do the right thing and be trying to get traction in their company and be their outside counsel who are advising them on, on different possibilities when there are gray areas in the law. And so hopefully one thing that uh, you know the EFF and the EDPS can do is help empower those people in the companies who are pro-privacy and pro-data security. And so then it would seem to me uh, things like rating the companies. And, and so my question to you is going to be, 
Um, has that been effective? Do you see companies competing for privacy? Is there some kind of marketplace solution here? So that's my question for you. And do things like ratings from EFF really matter? Or should we be thinking about other kinds of incentives? And Giovanni, well, the you know European uh, Union soon, when the general data protection uh, regulation comes into effect, is going to have a very powerful stick. It's going to be able to fine companies up to uh, 5% of the company's annual sales. Big stick. And so do, do you, so my question for you when Cindy gets through is, where is, is it going to be a matter of kind of big sticks? Will there be carrots in terms of incentives for companies trying to do the right thing? So we'll start with Cindy. So um, companies do compete for privacy. Um, and um, I would say that we started the Who Has Your Back ratings a few years ago. We started them, I think, in 2011. And we didn't get very much traction for the first couple of years. Um, but then the Snowden revelations happened, and the companies really started feeling the pressure. And uh, our list of things that a company ought to do in order to have your back uh, against uh, the U.S. government uh, suddenly became something that companies were falling all over. And if you look at the history of the way the chart has worked for the last few years, you start seeing this field of stars uh, after 2013. Um, and, of course, then we moved the goalpost on them because that's what we do and made them have to step up even a little further. Um, so I do think we're starting to see that. And the other place that I see it, um, two other places I see it, one is a bunch of tech companies joined with EFF to get uh, a bill through the California legislature, because you had asked about the state. It's called Cal ECPA. It passed with two-thirds majority. Um, it's a pretty strong bill. There's a few things that, that are in it that are weaker than I had wanted, but it's much stronger. It's stronger than anything that's happening federally. It's sitting on Jerry Brown's desk right now. So if you want to leave this room and do the one thing that you can do to protect your privacy um, that you can do right now that really matters, g go to EFF or go to any of the, the ACLU of Northern California worked with us on this, call Right, use whatever technique you can to get to Jerry Brown and tell Jerry to sign Cal ECPA. And tell the folks what it does. Cal ECPA does a couple of things. It requires a warrant for access to your communications um, by the California state officials. Um, so California law, only California state officials. So it doesn't help you with the feds, but most people are investigated by state officials. Most crime is state crime. That's a huge amount of investigations. It has a suppression remedy, which is a legal thing that says that if the cops come and get your data anyway, even though they're not supposed to, they can't use it against you in a court of law. That's a really big deal. It took a two-thirds majority of the California legislature to get that through, and we got it by one vote. Um, and it has a, several other things that are, are protective that we're really proud of. We're hoping it'll be a standard across the country. It's much better than the, there's a federal bill that's trying to update ECPA that's actually been weakened so much to be kind of beyond recognition at this point. It only does very small things. Cal ECPA is a really good model. It can be a thing that we can stand up for. Jerry Brown has vetoed similar legislation in the last couple of years, um, but we managed to neutralize a lot of the law enforcement opposition. This is our best chance ever. So if you do one thing, to protect your privacy, write Jerry Brown. If you know Jerry Brown, call him. He's got a really cute dog. You can tweet at the dog, whatever. This is our moment. And he has 30 days, I think, left to decide, maybe it's even 20 now, whether to sign it. So we're in a very, very small window. So that's my one pitch for something to do. The second thing, I think, uh, where I, and th that's because the companies felt the pressure from their customers that they wanted them to stand up for their privacy. This is not a priority that they otherwise would have had. But Google and a bunch of the other companies picked up this um, Vanguard and, and, and st stood with us to do this because they felt the pressure from their customers to do something um, f to protect their privacy. The other thing that we're seeing um, is Apple. Right, Tim Cook, who's the head of Apple, is st saying, my business model isn't to spy on you. My business model is to sell you devices. Um, and I, he's starting to make a pitch, you know, to show a contrast between him and Google and him and Facebook by saying Apple is um, more is is going to compete on privacy. It's a little bit now. It's a little there's. Apple's got a ways to go before I would really say they're a privacy protective company, but it's impressive to me that 
you know, whatever Apple's metrics for deciding how they were going to try to sell their products better, they decided that a privacy pitch was one that was important. And I hope that signals broader competition for privacy. Fingers crossed, anyway. Thank you. Um, compared to five, uh, six years ago, um, there are big improvements. Um, companies uh, increasingly um, understand the importance of um, compliance with, with data protection rules. They are investing more energies, for instance, on the appointment of privacy professionals. But all in all, um, the, 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 the balance is far for, for being uh, full satisfactory. Uh, compliance depends um, a lot um, from the business model and, and, and the business model uh, within certain companies to maximize as much as possible uh, the business at the expense of uh, users' um, rights. Um, we, we, we see that in, in few companies the appointment of data protection officers is a pure formality uh, we see uh, some um, top managers uh, still considering uh, a fine as a budget line, so that they, they prefer to, to, run, uh, to run a risk. Uh, they realize that day one is approaching, and day one is um, not because we would like to impose the, the EU rules, but European companies, those the big data players uh, established here in the US sh uh, should respect our rules and would be different because of the mis business model to fragment their um, they, they, they approach. So it's true that certain mobile device companies, such as Apple, for instance, have a different approach. Um, Fines. Fines are, are, are not the only uh, approach to, to, to get compliance, but uh, the regulation is a reasonable mix of uh, stick and carrots. Uh, the uh, amount of sanction you, you mentioned I is related to the worldwide uh, turnover and therefore will be, uh, I mean, an important incentive uh, for uh, severe breaches. Of course, we insist for scalability, uh, we, are, we are also pushing for remedial powers because, uh, in my viewpoint, it's also essential the proactive approach that certain companies are, uh, are taking. Um, we have to also clarify the links in between penal uh, and administrative sanctions. We have to clarify the role of, uh, of NGOs and in the um, in the app uh, where I have included my alternative text for the uh, the reform you can um, find it in in our website and and in two of the um, I mean well famous stores um, you will see that we um, we also um, included uh, other um, important um, important solutions in terms of uh, having a reasonable uh, a reasonable approach uh, and, and we also insisted a lot for giving uh, NGOs uh, an important role, not only where they, uh, they are formally delegated by specific data subject to, to represent them, because this is simply obvious according to the civil law, but because of also the ex officio competence of, of uh, all data protection authorities in the EU, we think that... Uh, Data protection authorities should be also accountable before NGOs. NGOs should be entitled, represent at least the representative NGOs should be entitled to submit uh, complaints and to see um, DPAs hearing uh, those um, those complaints. Uh, Europe is also discussing about the so-called class actions. There is an issue concerning the, the civil system in some um, in some. Uh, um, member uh, member states, and the accountability um, program is uh, uh, perhaps the the, the key. Um, I come from uh, a debate uh, um, which took place today uh, by considering the role of the top management of the board. In the next future, in the near future. Uh, CEOs, uh, director generals, um, will be unable to simply say that's an issue for IT people, for chief privacy officer, for external lawyers. 
because the way in which uh, the, the company wi will approach privacy will be increasingly an issue for, uh, for them in terms of reputation, uh, in terms of uh, um, legitimacy to continue performing this their, uh, their role. A and therefore, regardless of the sanction, uh, th th there are big, uh, big, uh, big changes. But we would like to also work on the basis of uh, moral suasion. So um, it's, a, it's a long process. Uh, it will not be simple. What I encourage, what I, what I expect is that they don't wait for the moment where the ink will be, will be dry. Uh, I had the honor to negotiate the current uh, d directive introduced <coughs> in 1995. At that time, we gave three years to companies to fully satisfy all requirements. And I remember three months before the 24th of October 1998, when the directive entered into force, companies entering into a panic mode, not only in, uh, in, in Europe and asking for extension. Um, this is not the, the, the right uh, approach. Um, uh, full compliance is to be planned, uh, is to be, uh, I mean, implemented. It will take time. So a last minute approach doesn't pay. Okay, let me ask a follow-up question to Giovanni and then a uh, further question to uh, Cindy. But I guess my follow-up question, what you've got on the table for us all now is the general data protection regulation. So you've mentioned the directive from 1995, which um, gave European countries three years for implementation by passing harmonization legislation. The EU is now, of course, looking at a data protection regulation, which means it will be not in need of harmonizing legislation in EU member countries, but it will be immediately applicable. So that's going to be a big day for U.S. companies. And in Europe, if you look at the literature, for example, in Germany, there's a lot of concern about centralization of power towards Brussels. In the U.S., we have different concerns. And I wonder if Giovanni can speak to them. What are we worried about? Well, we're worried about those high fines, 5% of global turnover. Big ticket item, right? If you think about Apple, Microsoft, uh, Google, having those kinds of fines on the table. And you know, if you look at the kinds of antitrust fines that the EU sometimes hands out, this is a huge leap, right, for data protection where fines have been relatively low until now. Another concern for the U.S., uh, Giovanni, is a relatively short period for data breach notification. Depending on which draft you look at, you know, about 72 hours. That's really tough for U.S. companies. Oh, and by the way, plug for the uh, EDPS. They have a wonderful app which you can download from the iTunes store, which has all the uh, versions of the General Data Protection Regulation, and with the version from uh, Giovanni's office, then in the final column, and it's extremely useful. So bravo for that. So what we're worried about, again, high fines, short period for data breach notification, and really a broadening of uh, EU jurisdiction beyond um, the kinds of data, protect data processing that got swept in um, by the old directive. So Giovanni, to tell us about the GDPR and how we should be thinking about it in the US, and then I'm gonna ask Cindy something about the NSA. I think we have identified the right balance in between proximity, uh, particularly for, for, for data subject. They should not suffer uh, because of the uh, globalized approach of, of companies. So every citizen should be uh, entitled to approach um, his or her own data protection authority uh, or, or national court, or perhaps approach another court uh, in another member state in, in cases uh, in, in case he or she is uh, out of the country. Uh, what we are going to centralize is um, the decision-making uh, process concerning cross-border operations. Here we would like to, to give um, um, companies uh, operating um, on a cross-border perspective or mm, performing activities <coughs> affecting individuals in more than one member state um, 
the uh, the chance to speak uh, to have a, as a contact point one lead authority, the one where the main establishment uh, is uh, is is located. So it's up to us to um, to have a centralized um, process to to uh, agree uh, as uh, 28 or in in all 28 member states the position to to be taken. But then the enforcement will will remain uh, at national level. So fines will be applied uh, by competent national authorities, uh, and, and, and relevant decisions could be challenged uh, at national level uh, a, as well. So um, the issue of the centralization um, is, um, I mean, in my view, a, a false problem. On, 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 on the contrary, we, we, we have identified a solution which is workable for other uh, other companies on security breaches we have identified a solution in our recommendations to uh, synchronize um, the the approach with other uh, existing rules i had the honor to discuss this issue m on on monday at the office of um, your uh, attorney general office since companies operating in in the us uh, will have to comply in the future simultaneously with uh, state law provisions and, and, uh, and our rules, um, and uh, we know that there is a perspective to have all in, in, in one day provisions at um, federal level, uh, provided that they, they will not lower uh, lo local, local rules. In my view, the accountability um, approach means that uh, what is essential is not to receive uh, uh, a notification for, for every minor breach or um, I within few hours. Um, I, I would much more appreciate less paper and, and a more dynamic approach where within, for instance, 72 hours, apart from real emergencies, I receive not only, um, I mean, um, an information, but also a report on what they are doing seriously, so about their reaction. Uh, taken by 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 the company, so a selective approach, depending on the seriousness of the risk, the kind of consequences on, on data subjects, and therefore the same selectivity should also relate to the kind of information to be provided to the large public or to specific uh, data subjects or group of uh, of data subjects. So here I am uh, quite confident we we have adopted the definition of uh, data breaches similar to the one in force for providers of um, publicly electronic communication services, but in terms of substance, since we are now considering uh, all kind of public and, and private controls, we would like to have a, 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 a feasible um, and unbureaucratic uh, um, approach. Um, on, on fines, um, I, I think, um, Again, the, um, the scalability may, um, may, may help. Uh, sanction I is, a, uh, is essential uh, for, uh, as a dissuasive measure, but in my view, it's also essential uh, what they should do in a later stage, um, meaning um, to provide a, a truly independent and more accountable data protection authority with the power to order not only not only to warn or admonish controller or to bring them before the court, but to order and to see the order uh, implemented in practice about the kind of measures that data subjects uh, need. Um, because otherwise we, we risk to simply have, um, I mean, more uh, budget lines um, concerning fines that you will pay as, uh, as consumers or subscribers. Excellent. Cindy, so my question for you, and then we'll go to the cards where there are so many wonderful questions. Uh, but to Cindy, where do you think the regulation of NSA spying should go in 2015, 2016? This is an issue you've worked really hard on. EFF has been litigating against it from day one with lots of ins and outs, and I've you know, put the cases in the different uh, editions of my own casebook <laughs> and been following it very closely. A lot of heartbreaks along the way, mm -hmm. some successes, and uh, it's been quite a trip, and it, Hollywood should really turn it into a movie starring <laughs> like your <laughs> attorneys, because it's, it's been exciting to follow. So 
Where does it go next, 2015, 2016? Has the USA Freedom Act gone far enough? What would you like to see? So no, um, the USA Freedom Act, which was passed in June this year, um, made some pretty significant changes to one tiny little piece of the NSA spying, the part where the NSA is collecting everybody's telephone records and has been doing that for the last 13 years. They're going to change uh, how that program works so that instead of the NSA collecting everything first and then sorting through after it has everything what it wants, um, they're going to have to make uh, requests to the phone companies to get that information. We think it's still overbroad, um, and there's some a lot of wiggle room for the NSA to do stuff we don't like in that, but it does fundamentally change the program uh, from mass collection to something at least a little more targeted. Um, but that's just one small piece of it, and frankly, I don't think it's the most important piece. Um, uh, to me, the the you know the 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 bombshell um, evidence that that we had in 2006, long before Mr. Snowden came along, although he did provide some helpful corroborating information, um, is that the NSA has convinced the American telephone companies, including AT and T and Verizon, to basically let the NSA sit on the internet at key junctures, including one at um, on Folsom Street, Folsom and 2nd here in San Francisco, the AT&T building there. If you're going down Folsom towards the freeway, you go by it. It's the one that has no windows on the first couple floors, kind of Darth Vader looking building, um, where the NSA has, uh, it's one of AT&T's major switching stations where if you're, you're an AT&T customer in the Bay Area and you're writing to somebody who's a Verizon customer or vice versa, it gets switched out from the AT&T network to the bigger internet. They're called peering networks network systems. Um, and AT&T basically runs a giant listening device there. It, it, technically what it does is it makes a copy of all of your communications. One copy goes to its destination, the other copy goes uh, into the NSA's effective custody. Um, so they can search it for what they want. And I, I think this is a tremendous problem. Um, most people's telephone uh, records are um, only slightly revealing what they do. I can trust, uh, if you're in the Bay Area, that your internet activity, which, by the way, can include your phone calls, because uh, even if you're using a regular uh, landline, often it gets carried over the internet. But certainly if you use Skype or Google Hangout or a chat program, it goes over the internet straight up. That information is being subjected to government access. And, and then you have to just cross your fingers and hope that you and someone you love will never get caught in their secret net. Um, that program is ongoing. In fact, the New York Times and ProPublica just released some schematics of it and similar programs of tapping into the internet in, on August 15th that came from the Snowden files. So we are a long way from reigning in the NSA to a place where they're properly subject to oversight and regulation and back to where they were supposed to be, which was, remember, the NSA wasn't supposed to spy on Americans. It was only supposed to spy on agents of a foreign power, which doesn't mean anybody who's a foreigner. That means anybody who's a foreign spy or a foreign agent. Um, that was the brief of the NSA, and they've not only expanded it to include anybody who's a foreigner, they've expanded it to, to include any American who talks to a foreigner, and on their way to getting there, they're just going to capture most of your domestic communications, too. Hope you don't mind. Um, I just think that's improper. I think it's a threat to our liberty, um, it's, uh, in addition to our privacy. Um, people can't be a free people if they think that they could be watched at any time and that they could be picked on at any time. This country was not built on that kind of a relationship with its government. Um, I think it's a problem for the Fourth Amendment and the First Amendment. Um, so I think you'll see the, the government's, one of its justifications for this is under something called 702 of the FISA Amendments Act. Um, that's that's a, a, a part of the law that says as long as the government's targeting foreigners, it can co collect uh, communications. Um, I don't think it was written, nor should it be properly interpreted, as to mean that all the rest of us get sideswiped on the w just because they have a foreign target, that they have to do something closer than that. Um, and so we'll be talking about that. We'll be also be talking about something called 12 triple executive order 12 triple theory, which is the executive order by which the president of the United States gives himself the authority to spy on the rest of the world. Um, um, 
nice work if you can get it. Um, and we think that's inappropriate as well. And there needs to be some, the US government has a duty to respect the fundamental dignity and privacy rights of people, not just based upon their citizenship, but based upon their humanity. And uh, a, a country that respects human rights and the rule of law and the protection of basic liberties shouldn't be making distinctions about who gets basic fundamental privacy based upon citizenship or presumed citizenship, but rather should stand up for human rights. And you know, the United States is supposed to be a bastion of that. And I think EO 12333 is a complete abdication of our responsibility to protect human rights. So we'll be talking a lot about that. Um, in the coming years. There's also fights about encryption I mentioned already. There's fights about whether we're going to have secure networks or not. There's a lot of revelations about the NSA tapping into our um, computers and attacking American companies that I think we're going to continue to talk about. So sadly, um, I guess I have job security for a while because we're going to continue to do this. Um, the attack on the the sitting on the network, the fiber optic cables, uh, is uh, central to a case that I've been handling since 2008 called Jewel versus NSA. That case will be heard by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, sadly not here, but in Pasadena um, on October 29th. Um, but frankly, the thing that's going to be heard in front of the Ninth Circuit is just another attempt by the government to slow walk the case and to slow it down. Um, we're hopeful that the Ninth Circuit won't let them slow it down and will require uh, the case to go forward. But um, we have suffered, uh, you know, the Obama administration claimed when the Snowden revelations came out that they wanted to have a public debate about the NSA's activities. And um, I, I have to say that is flatly inconsistent with their behavior uh, in the courts, in the Congress, and otherwise uh, since that day. Excellent. Thank you. So great questions from the audience. So here's one about uh, Europe's right to be forgotten. And both uh, Giovanni and um, Cindy can talk about this. Cindy, you may want to talk about whether something like this ever can emerge in the U.S. and why or why not. And the right to be forgotten, just to set a little context, uh, we can look at it upon a, uh, two tracks. The first track is, of course, the important European uh, judicial opinion, which is more of a right to be uh, delisted, saying to Google that certain search results had to be delisted from uh, European uh, Google domain names. So if you type in certain things in Google.com, even in Europe, you will get uh, all kinds of results. But Google has to delist those results if there's an invasion of privacy. Google uh, immediately set up a uh, process by which people can ask to be delisted, have the results delisted. They've acted on hundreds of thousands of requests, similar uh, programs uh, being run by Yahoo and Microsoft Bing. The second track is not at the judicial level, but it's at the GDPR, uh, which has uh, a right to, in certain instances, uh, uh, to be forgotten. So, in in the text of the document. So, uh, let's let's hear from that. Um, where do you think that's going to go, Giovanni? And then, Cindy, how does this work out in the U.S. if at all? Uh, the right to be forgotten is uh, an easy uh, icon for uh, for discussion. It does not correspond to 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 the reality. Uh, the judgment by the the court of justice is much less innovative than than it appears. Uh, the fact that search engines are subject to to the law, including the the EU law, the fact that uh, uh, IP um <coughs> addresses uh, and data they they publish are uh, personal information, uh, the fact that um, a data subject can uh, approach uh, a search engine as controller, uh, uh, all this uh, was already, um, I mean, um, very, very well uh, recognized. The, the only uh, novelty by a legal viewpoint you can find in, in the judgment, uh, Costeja Gonzalez, is the fact that uh, it is not indispensable to uh, approach first uh, the, um, the, 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 the source of the information and, and you can then, um, in, in submitting a, a request for delisting, as you rightly said, 
approach directly the search engine. This is the only novelty. So we are, we, we take seriously, extremely seriously, uh, any any concern um, relating to the freedom of expression. Uh, so these provisions on. Uh, um, I mean, the right to object, the right to the protection of personal identity cannot be um, misinterpreted, manipulated with a view to, um, I mean, um, act in breach of the freedom of expression. But I think the link uh, between the two uh, doesn't have uh, doesn't have any sense. We are, we are speaking about the uh, the right to object, the the, the right to a proportionate. Um, dissemination of, of information. It's true that uh, because of a peak last year, uh, search engines got um, thousands of requests, uh, but it's also true that uh, data protection authorities and courts um, identified a limited number of cases where uh, the request for the listing, uh, when refused by uh, search engines was uh, wa was unjustified. Uh, so I think this is part of uh, I mean um, standard standard business. We we had a lot of uh, requests for the listing in the past, and they have not been uh, commented or or not. The GDPR does not contain at the end any very innovative um, in a provision. The there is. Uh, on the other hand, an important point, which is the chance uh, that um, w when there is a ground to protect an individual, when uh, there are defamatory, um, I mean, data unlawfully disseminated, and we're not speaking about freedom of expression, and then there is ground for uh, a, a decision of the uh, for the listing. Uh, th this decision can, should not be circumvented by the search engine. So the debate around the uh, dot com, for instance, I is in our viewpoint uh, an important one. We didn't say in Europe uh, that the European law should be applied necessarily in 100% of the cases to every dot something, but at the same time, the idea that we can regionalize um, the um, uh, the World uh, Wide Web um, doesn't have citizens in, in, uh, in our viewpoint. So uh, it could be, um, and this is the position of um, all my colleagues in the EU, it could be that in some cases uh, even uh, Google.com should um, uh, I mean, Im implement such a decision. Not in 100% of the cases, but in many others, yes. Cindy. Oh, this is an area where we disagree. We agree so much. But uh, I think the right to be forgotten is a horrible uh, precedent for Europe, and it, it sh will not be adopted in the United States. It's flatly inconsistent with the First Amendment that somebody uh, who doesn't like something that's been said about them online can effectively black hole that information by making a request. Um, you know, such a situation would allow politicians to hide the fact that they got caught in a corruption or in bribes. It's basically a, a tool of censorship, and it's something that so far, anyway, is, is, has been used mainly by rich people to make sure that unflattering information about them isn't findable via search engines. That's who has access to these processes by which you demand to get yourself be taken off. It's, I think it's it, it it has not demonstrated that it it helps any uh, that it, it's helpful to people at the level of which it is actually just a censorship tool so that unflattering information isn't easily found anymore and we know that if you delist something from a search engine uh, it's very difficult to find it. We we worked hard in this country to stop a bill called SOPA and PIPA recently that would have essentially meant that a an, an accusation of copyright infringement could get you taken down off of, uh, get your website taken off search engines. I view the right to be forgotten as a, a rich person's tool to, to do the same thing that we fought back for SOPA and PIPA. And, you know, at EFF, we spend a lot of time trying to help people who've been censored for one reason or another. Um, one of the great things that the internet did was it let people who don't have power 
speak to the whole world. It let dissidents around the world be able to talk about what's going on in their countries, talk about corruption that they face. Some of these people, we spend years trying to get them out of jail, trying to deal with situations. Um, you know, we're right now we represent a tiny little newspaper um, out of Kazakhstan that has been publishing information that the Kazakh government doesn't like, and they've been going around the world getting injunctions to take uh, to 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 stop ISPs from hosting their websites, and they've approached Google and and Yahoo and Bing as well to try to make sure nobody can ever find this little thing on the grounds that, you know, it's publishing defamatory information by talking about corruption of the Kazakh government. Now, I'm not going to take a position on whether they're right or not. And my position is they ought to be able to speak and their speech ought to be able to be heard. Um, so I, I don't think that the right to be forgotten can come to the United States consistent with our First Amendment traditions and our First Amendment law. And I think it was a pretty bad decision in the European Union. Having said that, I think that to a certain extent... Um, there is a, an issue that needs to be addressed here, right? You know, uh, I care very deeply about people's privacy and trying to find ways to protect their privacy um, and trying to find something, uh, some way for people to have recourse when, uh, when, uh, uh, when they're being harmed by misinformation out there. But I, I think we have, we have tools that can do that. Google takes down a lot of information uh, based on uh, claims that something was uh, defamatory or otherwise illegal. They take down a lot of speech that's that way. But creating an open system for people to take down information that doesn't have a lot of checks and balances, has very little ability for somebody who posted something that gets take delisted to have recourse to say, wait a minute, this should go back up again. And do we want to create a huge process where people saying unpopular things have to go through a gauntlet when they've pissed off a powerful person. I worry that this right to be forgotten is going to end up in that as a tool for basically rich people to squelch poor people. So just in two, two little areas where we do have examples of a kind of right to be forgotten in the U.S. Uh, would be regarding revenge porn or what uh, Camelia Harris, the California Attorney General, uh, called cyber harassment. And so Google has agreed to take down, um, uh, if, if uh, contacted by a uh, person affected, uh, cyber harassment of certain kinds. Uh, and then the second example to think about where we do have a kind of right to be forgotten in the U.S. is a long-standing law, one of the oldest uh, information privacy laws in the world, uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, 1970, says that certain kinds of information, when it becomes too old, and an uh, example would be a bankruptcy that's more than seven years old, in many cases, it can't be used for a credit reporting decision. So really nice symmetry with the Gonzalez decision from the European Court of Justice, because that actually involved a linking to a Spanish newspaper with a report of Mr. Gonzalez's bankruptcy. So sometimes in the U.S. we do say uh, the information's too old and we don't want it to be used for certain purposes. Giovanni. No, dear, dear Paul and, and Cynthia, uh, um, I see your point. Um, I, I'm afraid we do not disagree in, in, in reality, since I think there is a misunderstanding. Um, uh, none of the cases uh, I mentioned by courts and, and, and European uh, DPAs, and even the same judgment, uh, can be applied to uh, defamatory declarations or uh, to, to freedom of expression. We are simply focusing on, on something uh, entirely different, which is, um, I mean, the process, the unlawful processing of personal uh, data. The same decision contains a clear reference to, to the need to uh, make a balance of interest and freedom of expression is, uh, is mentioned as, um, as first. Where applied in that sense, uh, he, then uh, I would fully agree w with you that we, we are on, on, on the right track. But the number of cases uh, I, uh, I have seen, uh, the, uh, I think we are around 45, uh, 50 decisions in, in the EU by, by data protection authorities. None of them uh, positive decisions uh, in case of previous refusal, none of them can be applied to, to the case of uh, defamatory actions. And I agree that there are 
other instruments to be to be uh, to be used, and, and I think that freedom of expression is to be carefully uh, evaluated. This is why uh, I continue to think that uh, the same uh, logo, right to be forgotten, is uh, improperly used in. Uh, uh, in this case, because um, those cases I mentioned actually relate to the unlawful posting of uh, uh, of data, and, and and where the challenge is not on the comment, uh, the challenge is not on the opinion, but mm, on an unlawful um, dissemination of personal uh, uh, information based, for instance, on, on on a crime, which is not uh, a crime in terms of. Uh, uh, defamation, uh, but but the crime in terms of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, collecting unlawfully information, and, yep. uh, and therefore we have to consider that uh, data subjects are, are are to be protected when it is uh, justified. The fact that the information are posted online is not as such a, a passport, a uh, passport to to I mean. Uh, to to say they should remain uh, there. I want to be protected offline and online, uh, regardless of the uh, need to protect the freedom of expression. Okay, so we have time for a kind of really quick question. We want to end on time though, for the uh, sake of the radio recording. But really, you know, in the lightning round, I'd like to ask you something. We have a question here, excellent question about the way technology is becoming embedded in our daily lives and um, how do we handle new tech? And for me, this is a question about um, the Internet of Things and the fact that we're surrounded in our daily life with so many sensors. So for Giovanni, my quick question for you, just in a few sentences, what do we do with the uh, long-standing data protection concept of data minimalization when we're really working towards a world of data maximization, collect a lot of information and try to do something cool with it and see what you find out. And Cindy, my question for you is, what do we do with this new tech, this world of uh, sensors everywhere and refrigerators on the internet and cars on the internet with government access to it? So qu quick answers, please. The solution is not to slow down this kind of innovation which will make our uh, life uh, easier. But there are many concerns, um, regardless not only security, but also uh, the ability of uh, each user to, mm, to design. So the emphasis is on the default, the emphasis in on, on the security of this information, the emphasis on uh, the transparency on, on any relevant use, because I will be connected with, with, with many things uh, and therefore I want to be in control of this uh, of this information uh, and these are big uh, big big challenges uh, and, and we really count on uh, um, the support of uh, designers and developers and and distributors Cindy I, I agree word. I think a few words uh, we need better incentives for security we need better incentives for companies not to collect things that they don't need. Um, we need more encryption, and we need to require warrants. Thank you so much. That's all the time we have tonight. On behalf of the World Affairs Council, I ask you to join me in thanking Giovanni Buttarelli and Cindy Cohen for this excellent discussion. And I would like to thank you, the audience, for your terrific questions. Good night. <laughs>